Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand and worship the Lord. <laughs> and rest ye merry, gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning worship service here at Lake Morton Community Church. This is the Lord's day. It's also the day that he has chosen to water his plants and trees and shrubs and flowers and all those things that make Florida a beautiful place. But we're glad you're here this morning. If you're visiting with us inside the bulletin, you'll see a little yellow slip. If you're comfortable with that, we'd like to get to know you a little better. Please fill out the information, drop it in the wooden box back by the back door and we will stay in touch with you get to know you a little bit better whether you fill out a slip or not we would appreciate if you just stay around for a few minutes after the service give us a chance to shake your hand get better better acquainted with you you'll find that we're just pretty ordinary folks we're real people that have been blessed by god have received real grace and we want to share that with you this morning, we're continuing the series of messages for Advent from different parts of the Old Testament. 
You'll hear the pastor preaching from Psalm 110 and then an emphasis in Hebrews a little bit later in the service. Right now, we're continuing to light the Advent candles, and David and Shelby are coming to have that honor this morning. It is an honor. Okay. Okay, our scripture reading for the candle lighting today is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time of worship today. I thank you for um, your incarnation and, and coming to this earth to eventually die for our sins and redeem us to yourself. I uh, thank you for just the fellowship that we have here at Lake Morton. I pray that you would bless our worship today and you would just speak to us uh, in pastor's message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Jesus is the king, amen? Last week, our sermon focused on the fact that Jesus is king in the line of David. So let's sing that to him. Let's crown him with many crowns. series has been called Jesus Foretold. So every week we've been singing the classic Christmas hymn, 
Come thou long expected Jesus. Is that your desire this Christmas season? Come thou long expected Jesus. Let's sing it again.
Jesus, let your glory fill the earth. Lord Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We desire to see you with our own eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And children, you may be dismissed for Children's Church. Let's uh, take a couple of moments and uh, confess our sins before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you this morning to worship you. You are the eternal God of all creation. And you, Lord, are greater than anything that we could ever imagine. We come this morning, Lord, to worship you. We come to be with other people who are like-minded, that love you, that know that Jesus, your son, came to this earth. The word become flesh. And he came as the sacrifice for our sin. And Father, I thank you so much that you loved us so much that you would give your own son and that he would shed his blood and pay the debt, Lord, that, that would, is impossible for us to pay. But he died and he rose from the grave and he defeated sin and he defeated death on our behalf. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would just leave our cares and concerns, Lord, all with you, and to realize that if you loved us enough to give your own son to die for us, that you, Lord, will take care of every need that we have. And Lord, thy kingdom come, and Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and in each of our lives, Father. And Lord, we do long for that day when faith becomes sight, when we see the incarnate word face to face and can fall at his feet and worship him. But Lord, I pray that you'll give each of us the strength that we need to live in this world until that day when we see Christ. And Lord, I pray for each of us here that you would give us grace to trust you more every day and that we would not live in fear of what happens in this world as we see the things happening all around us, Lord, whether it be wars or famines, disease, crime, all of the thing, Father, that, that cause so much grief in this world that are caused by men rejecting you. And Lord, I pray that we would 
that we would perform, Lord, what you have put us here to do, and that's to live for you and to be witnesses for Jesus Christ and to share the gospel. And Lord, my prayer and our prayer, Lord, for this church is that each of us would take our responsibility seriously, Lord, to share the gospel and to tell others of Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would see this church grow by people coming to know you. And Lord God, I pray that we would have unity. I pray, Lord, that, um, that this church family would grow in our love for one another and that people would truly know that we are yours by our love. And Lord, we thank you so much that you have provided every need that we have. Lord, you feed us every day. Uh, you provide all of our needs. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that none of us would be anxious about what we are to wear and what we are to eat, but that we would Consider you know, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how you, Lord, provide for them and how we are worth much more than they are. And Lord God, I pray that each of, each of us would always remember all that we have been forgiven of. And Lord, that we would extend that forgiveness to others if we have anything against one another lord i pray that we would make things right and that we would always remember just the sin that you have forgiven us of and father i pray that each of us would not fall to the temptations of this world the things lord that we see every day that that man thinks are the, the keys to happiness and satisfaction in this world, Lord, but Lord, that we would live for you, live lives pleasing to you. And Lord, please deliver us from evil and keep the evil one far away from us and our families. And Lord God, I pray that you will be with our pastor this morning as he brings our word, brings your word to us. And Lord, I thank you so much for the new members that uh, have come into our church. And Lord God, we just be with us, Lord, as we sing praises to your name and we listen to the truth of your word. And in Jesus' most precious and most holy name, I pray, Lord. Amen.
sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Good morning, church. Before we dive into the sermon this week, we get to introduce and welcome some new members into the church. So I'd like to ask Tristan and Aaron Anderson, David and Carol Cox, Lauren Straubel, and Matt Monroe to join me up here on the stage. Each of these men and women have taken our discovery class. They've submitted applications for membership, and they've met with me or an elder to discuss their walk with the Lord and what it means to be a church member, and they've had their confession of faith affirmed by the elders. And so today, the elders of Lake Morton Community Church are recommending them for membership. Membership is the foundational step for those who want to be a part of our body here. We believe that by becoming church members, we covenant together and proclaim that we're committed to one another. We believe that membership is important for several reasons. First, so that we can have a defined body of Christ, having a common confession of faith. Second, to give permission to other trusted Christians to hold us accountable and speak truths into our lives as we submit to uh, our, the elders' God-given authority. And third, to have an ordered approach to the use of our spiritual gifts and their benefit to one another. Membership is a relational covenant, a statement that I belong to you and you belong to me as one local manifestation of the invisible church. And it's a covenant to each other that we will live vulnerably as we seek help from one another in our walk with Christ, it's a recognition that we actually can't do this on our own. So these men and women have agreed to and are eager for that kind of relationship. They want to learn and grow in the word, they want to receive discipleship, and they want to benefit from your spiritual gifts. And it's our hope 
that they would find fitting ministries to serve in so that you can benefit from their gifts beyond just their personal relationship with you, and that they would join care groups and regularly attend our services. But more than that, we welcome them here to help us mold this church, knowing that the Holy Spirit regularly works through normal people to make the church what it needs to be as the body of Christ. Amen? So to that end, they are going to take membership vows. And as an affirmation, you are going to stand up, the members of this church are going to stand up, the members of this local body, and vow back to them, receiving them. And that is going to be your acceptance of their membership. So there are six vows that they will say in total. So new members, please respond to these questions with a simple, I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his wrath and without hope apart from his divine mercy? I do. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and have you received him and trust him alone for your salvation as he offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will seek to walk in holiness and honor Christ in all areas of your life? Do you promise to support Lake Morton Community Church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you promise to strive for the peace, unity, and purity of this congregation? Do you submit yourself to the authority of the God-appointed leadership of Lake Morton Community Church and accept their watchful care over your spiritual health, instruction in spiritual matters, and discipline should it be required. Now, will the members of Lake Morton Community Church please stand and take this vow in response as your vote and affirmation of these new members? Do you promise to receive these new members into this fellowship to show them love and honor as brothers and sisters in Christ and to encourage and support their growth in the Lord Jesus Christ in their participation and service to his church? If so, answer, we do. do. Praise God. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing Tristan and Aaron, David and Carol, Lauren and Matt to us. Lord, we we celebrate your church, the body of Christ. We thank you for giving us this new society founded upon the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for these individuals who have proclaimed faith in you, knowing that membership should only be made up of those who believe in the gospel of Jesus. We affirm now that they believe that, Lord. Hold us accountable to how they walk, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would give us wisdom as we walk together to be molded and shaped like Jesus Christ in our lives. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. God bless you. Thank you. I'll see you later. All right. Now it's time for the word. We're in the midst of our Advent series. Right now, it's called Jesus Foretold. We started in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God cursed the serpent. When we started out that morning two weeks ago, that may have seemed like a rather strange scripture to choose for Christmas, but we saw it's really just the starting point in the scriptures of expectation, messianic expectation. And when we looked at Genesis 3, 15, we saw how The themes introduced there, like offspring and victory, were gradually heightened through the Old Testament and ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And last week, Pastor Andrew continued the trend. I might add masterfully, the promised offspring of Eve, we found out, would also be the promised son of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. He would be king. So in the covenant that God made with David, messianic expectation, which was once very broad, is narrowed down. 
the Messiah would be the promised son of David. And Andrew walked us through how those promises made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He was the promised king. Before 2 Samuel 7, we saw all of these potential candidates who might be the promised offspring of Eve, who would crush the head of the serpent. We saw Seth and Isaac and Noah and Moses and Samson and Samuel, just to name a few. But 2 Samuel 7 heightened our expectations. They gave us clarity and a greater picture of the promised offspring. And now we come to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is our text today, a psalm of David. So let's stand and read together Psalm 110. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth, and he will drink from the brook by the way before, therefore he will lift up his head. Please be seated. Lord, we are so grateful once again to come before you and read your word together. We pray for wisdom and understanding, knowing that it's only by your spirit that we can understand and apply your word. So Lord, we ask for that this morning, that gift We thank you so much for all that you do for us day in and day out. We give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 110's impact on the New Testament cannot really be overstated. It's not only the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, it, it is the most quoted portion of the whole Old Testament in the New Testament. We find Jesus cited in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Peter brings it up in the book of Acts. It's on Paul's mind constantly, especially in the books of Ephesians and Colossians. The book of Hebrews is almost built around Psalm 110. Peter alludes to it in 1 Peter, and the book of Revelation uses its imagery constantly. So Psalm 110 is important. And as we'll see, important for Christmas. This morning we're going to continue our practice of seeing the text in its original context, and then we're going to connect it to the rest of the scriptures, and then we're going to tie it directly to Christmas itself. So without further ado, let's jump in. First, Psalm 110 and the Old Testament. The Psalms are a beautiful collection of songs and poems that teach us so much about God and about ourselves. Because poetry, unlike narrative, which we've been in the last two weeks, has a way of expressing emotion and expressing symbols that speak directly to the heart. And so it is here in Psalm 110. And in the Psalms, even to a greater extent, because these poems are inspired by the Holy Spirit. A couple of years ago, I preached the Psalms to high school students back in Iowa where I was a youth pastor. And my thought was, if I wanted to teach students about emotions and how to handle their emotions in a godly way, and teenagers have a lot of them, you can hardly do better than teaching it from the Psalms. In these poems and songs, we find great joy and great sorrow. We find confusion and lament, and exaltation, and glory, and anger, and grief, and wonder. And we find out how to properly have all of these thoughts and emotions, and and how to communicate them back to the Lord. So I'd encourage you not to neglect the Psalms. 
but to incorporate them into your devotional life as often as possible, especially as starting points for prayer. After all, these are some of the only places in Scripture where the text is focused on us talking to the Lord and not always on the Lord talking to us. So they teach us how to pray. But what about Psalm 110? Who's speaking? How does this psalm fit in? At first, it seems like a pretty strange psalm, right? Who is the other Lord? What's going on here? But let's walk through this psalm and see it for ourselves. Look again at verse 1. A psalm of David. Now, just to clarify, these headings and informational statements aren't added later in the English for our benefit. They are in the original Hebrew, so we can't neglect them, especially this one, especially Psalm 110. This is a psalm of David, which I understand to mean that he composed it. Jesus understood it that way, which we'll see when we look at the Gospels in a little bit, so I think it's best that we understand it that way. Verse 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Capitals L-O-R-D. You notice that? The first Lord. It's the proper name of God in the Old Testament. Nowadays, we like to say that name as Yahweh. That's how we commonly say it, especially in our English. So Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Whoever God is speaking to here, the author views as his Lord. It's an important note that we'll return to. This seems like a psalm that may have been spoken at a coronation. God is calling the new king to sit to his right, the place of honor. And then the prophet of the Lord is speaking this psalm to the new king. At least that's how many scholars understand the use of Psalm 110 in the Old Testament. Many of the psalms had official uses in the temple or in the palace or in the public sphere, and this may be one such psalm. And often, modern biblical scholars want to reconstruct what a particular psalm's use might have been. That's particularly helpful all over the place as we try to understand why it was written in the first place. But let's look at the imagery of this psalm with that understanding, that this is a psalm of coronation for a minute. In verse 2, we see God extend the scepter, a symbol of the king's sovereign authority. And the king is told to rule in the midst of his enemies, which means to, to conquer his enemies, to conquer and subdue them. Verse 3 is a little bit more obscure, but let's remember that theme of coronation for the psalm so far. It says, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. And so the king who is hearing the psalm should expect that his subjects will rally around him, eager to fight the king's wars. They offer themselves to the king freely. And in the Hebrew, it's literally something like the people are a free will offering. They join the king's army with excitement, eagerly, desiring to, desiring to see him conquer his enemies and desiring to join in that fight. But the next part of verse 3 is a little trickier. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. David's exalted language in the Hebrew is a bit difficult to translate into the English. There's a couple ways that we can understand what he's saying. First, we can understand David to be saying that the soldiers who eagerly join the king's army will be youthful and as plentiful as the dew in the morning. We find a similar statement to that in 2 Samuel chapter 17. Right in the midst of statements on war, in 2 Samuel 17 verse 12, we read this. So we shall come upon him in some place where he is to be found, and we shall light upon him as the dew falls on the ground. So the imagery is common. Another way to understand the end of verse 3 is, as a statement of the king's enduring youth. Something like, from this day forth, you will be renewed like the dew. Which is helpful too. In either case, verse 3 is a blessing on the new king. His army will be eager to join him for the fight, and he will be full of life. Verse 4 
is the most difficult verse to deal with if we're going to understand this psalm as merely something spoken at a coronation ceremony. The Lord has sworn, notice all caps, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why would a court prophet invoke the name of another king in the context of a coronation? Melchizedek, who is called a priest here, was mostly a king. We read about about that in Genesis chapter 14. He wasn't just the king of a random town either. He was the king of Salem. Salem, of course, comes to be known as Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the exact same town where the kings in the line of David would have been crowned. So why bring up an older king of the same place who wasn't part of the people of God? Of course, the book of Hebrews answers this question profoundly, but we we can't get ahead of ourselves. Some modern scholars who seem to poo-poo the New Testament's understanding of this psalm suggests that this was a way to make sense of the king of Israel reigning in the city of Jerusalem. Remember, David, the, the capital was in Hebron. David conquers Jerusalem, he kicks out the Jebusites, and he moves the capital to Jerusalem. So maybe this is a way of making sense of that. After all, Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High, the one true God, And so now the kings in the line of David will be like him, kings like him. Fair enough, I guess. Verses 5 through 7 are much easier to understand in terms of coronation. These are further promises made to the recently crowned king of all his victories over his enemies. He will shatter kings in war. He will pile up the corpses of his enemies. He will conquer heads of state over the land. And even when he stops for a quick drink, he'll be refreshed and continue the battle. It's a picture of a warring king, much like David. David was the king of war. And this king's conquests would be blessed by the Lord. The distinction between who is the actual Lord in verse 5 is unclear here. It is both Yahweh and the king, it seems. So if we take this psalm and we try to understand it, we try to maybe even take it out of the rest of the Bible without any reference to the New Testament, we can understand it kind of as an enthronement psalm, something that may have been spoken over a recently crowned king in the Davidic dynasty, which may have been the case. That may have been its original usage, and that's helpful to think about. But we can't stop there. As a side note, I want to express maybe just a little bit, a little bit of frustration with some of the academic works that I wrestled through in preparing this sermon. It's obvious from a Christian point of view that this psalm has everything to do with the Messiah, especially after reading the New Testament. Yet many respectable Christian scholars were unwilling to engage with that truth beyond a mere head nod, like they were passing it off maybe to the commentator for Hebrews, but we've got to deal with this right here. I found it incredibly frustrating, although I understand why they did it. They want to give you and and us the, the original meaning of the text, which is great, right? We want to know the original meaning of the text. Fair enough. But the fullest understanding of any text in the Old Testament has to be how the New Testament engages with it. Let me say that again. This is is why I bring it up. The fullest understanding of any Old Testament text has to be how the New Testament engages with it. Because Jesus Christ is God and he interprets the law fully for us. Now I bring all of this up to drive a point home not merely complaining. Two weeks ago, I asked if we sometimes view portions of the Old Testament as flyover states, right? We read a few chapters in Genesis, and then we fly over the rest to get to Matthew. I think sometimes we do. 
But on the other end of the spectrum, I'd like to say that we can never rip the Old Testament out of the rest of the Bible and try just to understand it for itself as if Jesus Christ did not come. He came to fulfill all of the law, the writings, and the prophets, and he did. So this psalm, whether originally used in ritual coronation or not, is ultimately about Jesus Christ. Did you notice as we were reading some of the callbacks to places that we've already been in the Old Testament in this Advent series? Verse 1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The footstool language is incredibly significant. We can find in many parts of the Old Testament this footstool language, but rarely is it used in reference to enemies. One of the most profound places where maybe this language started was Joshua chapter 10. Israel had recently defeated five kings of the Ammonites. And Joshua calls some of his generals to to drag the kings out to him and lay them down before him. Verse 24 of Joshua chapter 10 says this. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war, that's like his generals, who had gone out with him, he said, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet on their necks. Can you imagine seeing that? It's a powerful image. These generals are standing on the necks of the leaders of their enemies. That's what God is promising this king in Psalm 110. Standing on the neck of the enemy, making your enemy your footstool. Does that remind you of anything that we've read recently? Bells should be ringing loudly for Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Then David is promised, 2 Samuel 7, that his throne will be established forever, which is also language that we find here. Not only is this king sitting at the right hand of God in the place of honor. He reigns forever, we're told, now as a priest king in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 6 says, he will shatter chiefs' heads. But the Hebrew is actually that word for head. It's not chief. The king would shatter the heads of his enemies even as his own head is lifted up in verse 7. I mean, come on. He will shatter heads? Who's supposed to do that? The offspring of Eve. This psalm is all about that promised offspring, the son of David, the anointed Messiah. The New Testament authors, along with Jesus himself, understood that. Like I mentioned before, they're constantly referencing Psalm 110 when they speak about Jesus. So let's see how this psalm is used and referenced in some of these major books of the New Testament. We can't go through all of them because it's quoted too much. We're going to go through the main ones. So second, Psalm 110 and the Gospels. Jesus quotes Psalm 110 verse 1 in each of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Remember, those are called synoptic Gospels because they view the life of Christ from a similar standpoint. So the narrative of each is complementary. So in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus asks a question to a group of Pharisees that he's around. Verse 42 says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Which is a softball question for Pharisees. These are experts in the law. The son, they say, it's the son of David. The Messiah is the son of David which of course is the correct answer and what Jesus was expecting them to say. But it's not the whole answer, and that's his point. So Jesus says in verses 43 and 44, how is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Then Jesus asks, if if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? The Pharisees are flabbergasted. 
Verse 46 says, And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. They're so blown away by Christ's question that they stop asking questions. Now, I'll stop myself from going too long in Matthew 22 because you're going to hear all about it again next November. But let's talk about Jesus' mind-blowing question, the one that stopped up the Pharisees. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Notice that Jesus assumes David is the author of Psalm 110, And that David is the one speaking through the psalm. This helps us interpret Psalm 110. Remember, the psalm opens with, Yahweh says to my Lord. So Jesus is saying here that David views the one sitting to the right of God as greater than himself. Whoever this Lord is, he is greater than David. Jesus' words teach us that the best way to understand Psalm 110 is to start from the perspective both of David's authorship and as the prophet speaking. David is the prophet here. And as we look at how the psalm is written, it's from the perspective of a prophet speaking to the recently enthroned Messiah King. And that prophet is David speaking to his greater son, Jesus, who was promised to him in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Jesus' whole point in Matthew 22 is that the promised son is him. He is the offspring of Eve. He is the one sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus' question, the one that caused the Pharisees to, their brains to explode, is easily answered once we understand who Jesus is. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? The answer is that Jesus is both the promised son of David, which all of the genealogies prove, and that he is the greater son of David because of his divinity. Jesus' question is so mind-blowing because he connects the promised king to God himself. The Pharisees failed to realize that the promised son of David would also be God. The son of David would be greater than David because he's divine. The Gospels of Mark and Luke both reference Psalm 110 as well, but they're parallel passages to Matthew, almost identical. Matthew's account is a little bit longer. It has the most detail, so that's why I'm limiting our look at just one of them. Jesus' use of Psalm 110 to demonstrate from the Old Testament that he is both God and king is mind-blowing. With the Pharisees, we should be reeling from that idea. He is the promised king in the line of David and also greater than David, God himself. But if there was a book of the New Testament that used Psalm 110 more than any other and to the greatest effect, it would be third, the book of Hebrews. It was pointed out to me recently by a faithful commentator that the structure of the book of Hebrews resembles the structure of Psalm 110. The book starts off with the absolute supremacy of Jesus Christ, even quoting Psalm 110 verse 1, chapter 1 verse 13 of Hebrews. Then it details how Jesus is greatest over all creation, that he's even greater than the likes of Moses, Abraham. And then we get to chapter 5 through 10 which focus on Jesus' priesthood at length until he returns to the topic of faith and the greatness of Jesus. Of course, it's it's a loose comparison. It's not identical, but it's no accident that Hebrews could even be conceived as structured like this. It's constantly pointing back to Psalm 110. So keep a thumb in Psalm 110. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. In chapter 4, the author of Hebrews said that Jesus is our great high priest. And he goes on to say this in verse 15 of chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. 
So the author of Hebrews places the priesthood of Jesus Christ as our foundation for our confidence to approach God. So it's really important that we understand that Jesus is our high priest. But the author wants to be careful. He wants to say that Jesus is not a high priest like all the other high priests in Israel. So he says in chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But instead of continuing that train of thought, which he wants to do, the author rebukes his audience in chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. They're dull of hearing, he says. They're only ready for milk instead of solid food, even though they should be mature enough to understand what he's saying. He wants them to desire to know the weightier things of theology, to understand that Jesus is our great high priest, and to understand how that's the case. But don't worry, he gets back to the topic at hand at the end of chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 say, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner places behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, verse 4, again. Then chapter 7 carries the topic onward. I, I won't read it all to you, although I'd really like to. In verse 11... The author points out that the Levitical priesthood, the one that started at Mount Sinai, right, could not attain perfection through their sacrifices as much as they tried. They could not attain perfection. But that a change in the priesthood from Levitical to Melchizedekian, there's your word of the day, also brings a change in the law and a new covenant. So using the theology of Psalm 110, the author helpfully shows that Jesus is a priest in a different order, in the order of Melchizedek. Now, this this is dense biblical theology. That's why the author of Hebrews stops himself in chapter 5 to rebuke his audience. It's thick stuff, so stay with me. Melchizedek, as we've already seen, was a priest king in the city of Salem. Abraham encounters him in Genesis chapter 14, but something strange happens in that encounter, something that we wouldn't expect. And this is the the author of Hebrews' whole point. Melchizedek, whose name is kind of funny sounding, Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness, is the king of Salem. So he is king of righteousness, and Salem, of course, means peace. So he is also king of peace, This man is a foreshadower of a type of Christ. He served the Most High God as both ruler over his people and intercessor for his people. And this priest, whose town is saved by Abraham, this is what's funny that that happens in this encounter. He doesn't come out to Abraham and like fall on his knees and thank him so much or anything like that. He doesn't come out to Abraham to give him a lot of gifts. Instead, Abraham gives Melchizedek a tenth of all the spoils of the battle. He pays a tithe to Melchizedek. The author of Hebrews points out that in doing this, Abraham recognizes that Melchizedek is greater than he. So we have this guy, the king of peace and righteousness, receiving a tithe from the father of the anointed nation of Israel. And then he's never mentioned again. Until Psalm 110. Not mentioned one more time in the Old Testament. Kings were not priests. Let's make that clear. Kings were not priests. Priests. Saul, Saul was punished in 1 Samuel because he wrongfully offers sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel to offer them. Saul makes a big mistake, and that's why David's eventually anointed. The offices were distinct and separate. Kings were not priests. That is, until David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Then a few funny things happen that we don't expect. 
He wears a priestly ephod as he makes a fool of himself dancing before the Lord. And he offers sacrifices himself to the Lord. This is 2 Samuel 6, right before the covenant is made. So unlike Saul, David is not punished. He's blessed with a covenant. Neither is his son Solomon as he oversees the sacrifices in the temple in 1 Kings 8 after it's built. In fact, we start seeing hints of a priest king through the rest of the Old Testament. This psalm is the chief example, but we also see it very clearly in the book of Zechariah. The author of Hebrews is, is aware that all of this has been developing, that God has been slowly revealing that the Messiah would be a priest king. Jesus Christ is the great high priest, but not a high priest like that of the line of Aaron of the Levites. He is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, which means he's also king. The author goes on in chapter 7, verse 15. This becomes even more evident when another high priest, when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, like the Levites, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's the resurrection that qualifies Jesus for this priesthood. His life was indestructible. So what does all this mean? The author says in verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, consequently, verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus, our great high priest, who reigns forever at the right hand of God in the order of Melchizedek, saves us to the uttermost completely because he always makes intercession for us. We don't need another great high priest. He has finished the work. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm tempted now to just walk through the rest of Hebrews because it's one of my favorite books, but I'll, I'll stop myself from doing that. But I want to mention one more thing. Just one, just one. Turn with me to chapter 10. Chapter 10, get this. Verses 11, 12, and 13. Now take all that we talked about, all this Melchizedekian stuff, and bring it here. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11, 12, and 13. Listen. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time, listen, until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Praise the Lord. Notice the language. It's Psalm 110. Jesus, after offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins, he sits down at the right hand of God because his work is finished. And now he's waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. Praise God. This is our priest king. The book of Hebrews is really rich. And I want to spend more time here. Maybe someday we do a series in the book of Hebrews. But we've, we've seen how one verse works itself out. One psalm works itself out, especially rich, richly in this theology of Hebrews. And it's important, though, that we move on to verses 5 through 7 of the psalm because they are fulfilled. They are fulfilled fourth in Revelation. Psalm, uh, verses 5 through 7 of Psalm 110 are really intense. Let's read them again. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. 
He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. So if Psalm 110 is a prophecy about Jesus, in what ways does he fulfill these verses that seem violent to our ears? Verse 1 of this psalm is all about Jesus' accomplished work in his post-ascension rest at the right hand of God the Father because the work of salvation is finished. And this is accomplished through his death and resurrection, which we see echoes of in verse 3, and the fact that Jesus' strength and youth are eternal. He's constantly renewed like dew of the morning. Verse 4 is about his mediating role right now. As he sits at the right hand of God the Father, he is your mediator. First John chapter 2 says he is your advocate before the Father. He is the priest king. But verses 5 through 7 are about his second coming. Here we find the Christ who is Lord, shattering kings on the day of his wrath. It's reminiscent of Revelation 19, where we see Jesus, this Messiah, as the rider on the white horse. So listen to these words. This is how Revelation 19 talks about Jesus' war against his enemies. Verses 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You notice the imagery of Psalm 110? The rod of iron that he rules with? His army that comes around him joyously, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure? And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. This is the king of Psalm 110. The language of Revelation 19 is even stronger than the language of Psalm 110. Jesus will come again in wrath to destroy his enemies, which are all those allied to Satan and the forces of darkness. He will come again as the conquering king, and he will not slow down. He will not experience defeat, just like the king in Psalm 110 who takes a quick breath for a quick drink before continuing his work, Jesus will come and absolutely destroy his enemies. What an awful day. What an awful day that will be for those found apart from the great high priest. God, in his patience, has decided to give us some time to respond to the message of the gospel in faith, to repent from our rebellion and believe in the Son. There's time. But that son will not always be waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, as verse 1 says. There will come a time when his enemies are placed under his feet, and a time when he crushes the head of the snake for good. Where will you be on that day? Will you be one of his people who are arrayed in fine linen? Eagerly joining his army like a free will offering? I pray that you would be. And you can. You can through faith. Faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the good news is that Jesus didn't come first to place his enemies under his feet, which he will do. 
He came first as a little baby in a manger. Fifth, Psalm 110 and Advent. What does this psalm have to do with Christmas? It's a a reminder that Jesus has made a way for you to be reunited with the Father. He is the great high priest seated at God's right hand who is able to sympathize with us in every way. He's the great high priest who offered once for all a sufficient sacrifice for every sin you've committed. And he is also king, the promised son of David who is seated at God's right hand. And it's a reminder that in order to do all of that, in order right now to even be waiting to have his enemies made his footstool, he was first born in a stable, surrounded by filthy animals. The priest king was a lowly peasant. The great high priest knows what it's like to be us. Psalm 110 is a reminder of the greatness of Jesus. It's a call to worship this morning that Jesus has accomplished it all on your behalf and he is your high priest and king forever. And his incarnation is a reminder of the humble way he achieved that. A Christmas song that's been on my mind this last week. Much to Ashley's chagrin as I whistle it is once in royal David's city. Listen to the words of verse 2 of this, this song. I think it helps us understand the significance of Psalm 110 in Christmas. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. And his shelter was a staple, and his cradle was a stall. With the poor and mean and lowly lived on earth, the Savior holy. Would you give yourself completely to the humble priest king today? Let's pray. Lord, we we love you. And we are thankful that your glory will forever be shown in your second coming, that everybody everybody with eyes will see that you are king. But Lord, we also thank you that in your first coming, you came humbly. Lord, the creator of the universe, you decided to be born in a stable, which teaches us of our own humility. Lord, how often we desire to assert our own selves and our own needs and our own wants. Lord, let us be more like you, who though now is exalted above all others, rightfully so, King of kings and Lord of lords, was born as a baby, placed in a manger. We worship you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand now and respond to the word of God in song. has known where faithful ones from every time will one day
Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Amen. Take out your bulletin with me. Check this out. <clears throat> Several announcements on the back here. We are gathering together an adult choir for our Christmas Eve service, our evening service. We'll be rehearsing this Wednesday, 6 to 7.30, the last opportunity that you have to join the choir, but it's not too late. So come do that. Join the choir. Uh, sing with us. You don't have to be a good singer. Just get up here. <clears throat> there are no Sunday school classes on the 24th or the 31st this month, so enjoy a little bit of extra sleeping in. But January 7th, we will start our new Sunday school class that will run for adults and children. We're going to be walking through the New City Catechism. The New City Catechism. A catechism is just a brief summary of the Christian faith, and it's a teaching tool. So we'll use it to teach our children basic Christian theology. It's a question and answer section. <clears throat> and we'll use it as a starting point for conversation in our adult class. So you can download the New City Catechism app for free right now and have that on your phone and start looking through it. And you can also purchase a physical catechism if you'd like that for your home. There, there's also a kid's version of that catechism, parents, and there's a devotional that's available. You can find all of those in the link here crossway.org. Uh, a new announcement that's not in your bulletin. We found out this recently. The Abanez family, uh, who are missionaries that we support in Puerto Rico, found out that they, ha they have to be out of the country for a full year because of visa issues. Their visa was denied. So they are looking for housing here for th two or three weeks in January. Probably plan for three. So if you are available to help house the Ibanez family, please let me know, or I'm volunteering you, please let Andrew know after the service. You don't have to do the whole time, although they have two little kids, so it might be nice for them to be in one place. So if you have space for the Ibanez family for about three weeks in January, please let us know. We'd like to try to figure out that problem for them. In the back of the room today, there are New Testaments available for you to pick up and give to somebody. Use it as an evangelistic tool. The, those are free. Just, just grab one. Give it to a neighbor. Give it to a loved one. Uh, they, they have information for our services and information about the gospel in them. So make sure you take advantage of that. We still need some nursery workers. So is Ken in the room? Ken's back. If you are willing to help in the nursery, would you please talk to Ken today? We just need like one or two more people. If you're willing to help in the nursery, please talk to Ken. Uh, the library will be open this afternoon. It's not in your bulletin, but it is open today. So, so uh, please don't forget to check out our library. We have all kinds of books and resources, especially a lot of good Christian and theology books down there. So if you're interested in something, go check it out. Take advantage of that. Come receive prayer this morning. Receive prayer from an elder. Up here on my right will be... Ken, Ken Adams up here on my right, on my left will be Ed. Come receive prayer. If you have something going on in your life, whatever it might be, we want to pray, we want to pray over you, we want to pray about it. Um, there's all kinds of things that come up, especially around Christmas time, so make sure you come and receive prayer from an elder. You can also share with them good things going on in life. All right, now, as a benediction, would you receive the words of Jude, verses 24 and 25. Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.